We'll get started in just a moment, but go ahead and start getting your questions in the chat window, so our moderators can start relaying those to me as soon as we start. Please try to keep the questions concise and watch your spelling, and try to be polite to others in the chat. We usually go for about an hour so you probably want to grab a drink and a snack, though we'll take a break about halfway through too. With all that said, welcome and let's get started. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our last live stream for the year. We're getting started in just a moment as we get questions ready, we've had a few people away for the holidays so we're kind of going to be running things as we can, so there may be a few technical glitches as we get started up here. As usual, my wife Sarah will be asking us our questions, try to get them posted into the uh, live stream chat, and uh, I know it's John, Michael Godio is here today, hey John, and um, as we get started here, just go ahead and post those in the chat, try to make them as pronounceable as possible. Well, our first question today is coming from Chris Leach, and he says, Hey Isaac, hope you had a Merry Christmas. Wondering what your thoughts are on the Biosphere 2 experiment and the challenges of maintaining a small, closed-loop ecosystem. How can we overcome it? Oh, Biosphere 2, that was in the, I can't remember if that was late 80s or early 90s. For those of you who aren't too familiar with it, um, check Wikipedia for more accurate details. But I believe it was out in the uh, either Nevada or Utah. They built a very large greenhouse multiple domes, things like that. And the idea there was to check and see if we could actually do a completely separate ecology that was closed off. And they sent six people in, I believe, for that. Um, there were problems with data, collecting the data, and some cheating on carbon dioxide as well as snacks. And so we were never too sure if we got the data on it right. But that was one of our first big attempts to really see if we could do a closed environment. And I think we probably do a little bit better these days. We get some useful ideas out of it, mostly from where it fell kind of through. Um, I believe they transferred that property over to a university afterwards, but uh, to be a big greenhouse. But this is always a concern we have: is how big of an environment do we need to be closed? And critically, with spaceships, unless they're generation ships, they don't actually have to be closed. They just need to leak or be uh, running out of things that are difficult to manufacture, slower the duration of the trip. So, uh, and of course, what I call it biosphere one. It's biosphere one being Earth, biosphere two being that environment. Um, so. We always need to do more projects on that, but for right now, we're about as close as we can do to short doing something Antarctica or Mars itself to check. <clears throat> Jonathan Kernkamp asks, in the video on superconductors, you said that we could build larger structures if we implement them, but I don't see how that makes sense because the load still transfers through the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Could you explain, because I can't think of any explanations myself. You're looking at it from the wrong direction, what I meant by, you know, to have more on there. It's not that a superconductor can hold a vast amount more mass, it's that you can build a much bigger platform when you're not having to pay the electric bill of all the wasted energy. With a superconductor, they're not using the energy up to hold the thing in place. Neither is any magnet, but a magnet is constantly going to be <clears throat> leaking, um, electricity, leaking resistance, leaking heat. A superconductor is not doing that. So there's no change in the basic mechanics of what's going on there and the superconductor is vastly more efficient and therefore you can pay for a larger megastructure as well. Our next question is from The Cool Shark. Hey Isaac, when you talk about self-replicating machines, you always seem very confident that it could be done with very near-term technology. What would have to happen to make one today? Uh, with self replicating technology, we usually have as the simplest version of that um, what's called a clanking self-replicator. Uh, by the way, if anyone's wondering what just happened to the screen there, I was uh, monkeying around with a new widget called a chat box on here, so I was enlarging it and grabbed the long screen. Um, a clanking self-replicator is the notion that you're not being tiny little nanobots. Right? Usually people think self-replicating machines from science fiction, they think tiny little things the size of viruses or cells. But realistically, a much easier uh, self replicator would probably be something very large along the lines of a factory. Clanking self replicator is more the idea that you're setting up an entire in, you know, industrial chain. And what actually qualifies the thing being self replicated is a little complex at that point in time. But a factory that was able to have a bunch of robots who went out and dug things up or controlled its mind facilities, things like that, that could become a, a self replicating factory as well. That becomes your clanking replicator. And the other thing to keep in mind with self-replicating machines is it doesn't necessarily have to be the entire chain of production. Like, I am a self-replicating machine in theory, though, um, uh, not the same way my cells are, but I don't actually go out and grow it all my own food. I get it packaged from the store for the most part. Um, I don't provide all the electricity that runs my lights. So a self-replicating machine doesn't actually have to be any more 
self-independent than the circumstances of why or, or what we ourselves would be inside our ecosystem. And that's kind of the notion of, can we do something like that today? And the answer would usually be, yes, if we really want to, we could, but it wouldn't be the most efficient way to do it. Um, self operating machines come a lot more easy when you have better automation in terms of the intelligence and software. Prior to that, you're not really gaining anything from having a, a factory that's able to clank out all the little bits it needs. So that's kind of coming along in stages. We could probably build one today if we really want to. Whether or not it be economical or not, I don't know. Jayhogs90 says, any thoughts on the Proxima signal and the validity of it being an actual text signature? Uh, you know, I was just thinking because I saw uh, that John had joined us today, he'd be a better guy to answer that question. <laughs> so I would defer to him, and I imagine if he hasn't already covered on his show, he probably will. Uh, we were talking about the WoW signal that long ago, and uh, I don't know if I actually mentioned it. Um, for those of you who follow Event Horizon, uh, John Michael Godier's other show, uh, I was on there as the guest. For, uh, we recorded earlier this month, but I would have been for uh, Christmas, so that episode would be out, and it's a good thing to go watch after we're done here on the live stream. Hmm. It's interesting to see the chats popping up on the live stream uh, while. Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a bit of a difference. Uh, I, I think we lost some of the folks. We usually have this get shifted over in the Discord for our mods to put it over there, and it's not usually on the screen in front of me, so I can't see them at all. But I have them pop up on two separate screens in front of me over here. One over there on the, uh, well, I'll pop it over. For those who are wondering about the other side of things, there's a look at the studio from the other direction. And I think you see the top of Sarah's head over the model and the other model on the other screen. <laughs> so, um, so we all kind of running things as we go, but it's, the chat's up on the screen now. <laughs> Um, I know we've had questions from Isaac Bordeaux in the past, but today he wants to know if you like your coffee and what you think the scariest concept in science is. Yeah, I do. Um, I usually, well, I was about to say, I usually get a bit of a coffee stop by my friends, but one of my friends is actually a worse coffee stop than me is coming over for dinner tonight. So. Uh, I switched over last year to uh, cold brew coffee. I, I heat it up still, but uh, a lot less acid, which is a lot less nice on the stomach. But I usually take a dark, and these days, with a lot of cream and uh, artificial sweetener also. <laughs> And there was another question in there like, well, I got distracted by coffee, wasn't there? I, I lost track. <laughs> yeah, it was what what you thought was the scariest concept in science. Oh, um, hmm. Well, I, I guess entropy by default would be the scariest one, the idea that everything is going to run down to the end. But I, I would generally tend to say that quantum mechanics was always the most uh, existentially horrifying to me. <laughs> so the basic idea that things are random and uncertain is... Uh, well, I'd say it was horrifying to me when I first found out about it, but I actually kind of tend to think of it positively these days. So, well, Somebody has a question for me. They ask if I'm supportive of the bolo tie or if you would prefer a bow tie or more standard tie. I would say any tie except a bow tie. I yeah, like I'm your not bolo a bow tie. tie person. <laughs> I think that would be... I'm, it would kind of look like Dumbo, you know, get some big ears coming out around the chin. I very have Bill Nye, too. Um, <laughs> Bill Nye, the science guy, not, but we have a superintendent of the school. It's just South of us who's uh, Bill, Bill Nye, too. Um, and, uh... It would have say, to be a very small bow tie. Yeah, I, I don't... I'm not really a bow tie person, so, <laughs> But a bow tie, like many things, becomes uh, emblematic or symbolic of a given show or enterprise. is just one of those things I saw on Amazon one day. I thought was cute. <laughs> Plus, it has a pie symbol. Mm -hmm. Uh, St. Lauren Beat says, What will be the most important planets to humanity after Earth in the future date during this... during late this century and early next century? What will be the most, excuse me? Important planets to humanity, other than Earth. Jupiter. Um, I, I, to some degree, it kind of depends on what you consider a planet. Um, but uh, Jupiter would be the biggest one in a lot of ways because it's got all those old moons on it that have such low gravity get on off of them. And they're all in a nice, tight cluster with each other. And um, Future, date, during, oh. this, during late this century. <laughs> Too many screens up. Uh, so the European moons, uh, Europa, the other moons of, of Jupiter, may be Titan around Saturn too, but it, in that case, it's not really the planets themselves so much as their moons, but Jupiter itself becomes more important to us in the late phase of things too. But I really wouldn't say that either Venus or Mars are really important to us other than as symbolic goals. Okay, we have a question um, from Sien Yassar. What would it look like uh, to gene edit based on a Kardashev 1 civilization? Uh, check back in 20 years. I mean, we are so close already to being uh, able to do that at a, at a, what I'd say, economical and useful level. Um, and we are getting pretty close to being a K1 in a lot of ways, too. 
it's not that big of a technological jump. You know, I don't usually think of K1 and K2 as really these these goals or benchmarks for progress. They are just kind of states like saying, your country hit 100 million people. Um, you know, your power production hit one gigawatt, that kind of thing. But uh, gene editing is going to be most useful when we're actually able to set it up so that we can edit someone's entire adult DNA strand. Prior to that, it's mostly useful for creating new crops, new non-human things, because we won't really be using it for humans much until then. When you can edit it in adults voluntarily in, their, in its entirety, that's when it becomes useful for us, and that's got to be, uh, I would still say this century, but not towards the end of it. Um, thank you to Out of the Blue Crafts for your donation, and also Alaskan Ballistics, and, but they both say, I love your channel. Uh, Alaskan Ballistics says, I binge watch it often, again and again. Um, we also had a question from Raven609, why don't we see your map of Lithuania anymore? The map of Lithuania? Oh, the, that I think it was Latvia, wasn't it? Uh, that was a card from uh, from Agni Seraphite, actually. Uh, a friend of mine from on, on the... Um, she sends me postcards when she would travel. I always like getting postcards from people and almost nobody actually sends them to me. Um, new office, new studio. Things get sorted around. I think it's probably boxed up somewhere. Um, <laughs> I redecorated. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Sarah actually did a lot of redecorating here. Uh, we, I think I'll, I'll flick over the webcam again. Since I have both cameras actually up and live, you can see the gigantic tapestry up behind... Well, I guess you can see the top of Sarah's head again towards behind the microphone. It's like framed by the microphone right now. Um, that was mostly there for uh, sound absorption, <laughs> I hate to say it. Uh, by the way, since some of you will probably be joining us, hopefully on Facebook this time too, we are trying to simultaneously cast a Facebook Live. And as a quick side note, Sarah, uh, Stellarator is actually up on Discord right now putting questions in too. Oh, nice. So, right. Okay, uh, so we have a question here from... Uh, the real Boliath. Other than common sense, why do we assume that closed causality loops are impossible? Usually because they don't tend to be too too coherent when you actually start examining them. For those of you who don't know a closed causality loop, the basic idea being that you travel back in time to do something that changes the past of the world, but essentially causes a closed loop. E.g., I go back in time to... Uh, to do something and I uh, accidentally kill my grandfather and marry my grandmother or have a child with my grandmother and it turns out that I really was my own grandfather. E.g. that's the closed loop there. Um, and uh, usually you start plucking those apart individually, they do not make sense for repetition. They, you know, they, the cycle wouldn't be able to continue down that road. There are all some basic ideas like the Nokia, Nokia self-consistency principle, see our time travel episode, where basically would hold the idea that if you could travel in time, which for the record I tend to think is impossible, but if you could travel backward in time, that the only changes you could actually have happen would be those that caused a consistent future. Uh, as an example of how that could happen, um, you know, a, a drop of water comes down here in Ohio. It does make its way back into the ocean. Which path it takes, it's hard to say. It usually will go down the St. Lawrence Sea way out through the lakes, but it could go so many different ways. But it's going to get its way down there, and only paths that actually result in it getting down there need to be considered. So you might have one where you went back in time to save JFK from being assassinated, and you succeed. Well, now, why did you go back and, and try to save him in your future again? Well, because one of the allowable futures is one where you have always been lied to about that, or you are insane and believe he was assassinated still, even though he wasn't, and thus travel back in time. And those start getting kind of absurd, but they're all possible. So those would be examples of how the Nokia self-consistency principle could allow a closed time loop. Stellarator, thank you so much for your help. We have a question here from Joshua. If a Dyson Swarm was constructed as close as possible to a star in order to lessen the mass budget of a swarm versus the energy budget and construct them only around the smallest stars, might that limit the infrared acts excess to values that we see in several galaxies that have been searched for K3 civilizations. And, um. <laughs> moreover, if Dyson swarms are used for star lifting, then they might grow exponentially covering the entire star. In that scenario, we might never spot any Dyson swarms at all. A problem people sometimes have with things like what we call the Dyson dilemma, which is fundamentally what started the show up, 
is the assumption that the Dyson dilemma itself is, is really requires that you specifically do Dyson spheres. What it's actually saying is that a growth-based civilization is going to eventually make use of all of its energy that it can get its hands on, or all the matter it can get its hands on, unless, and it, by the easiest route possible. So that as long as you can't do certain things like create yourself, you know, a, a perpetual motion machine or tap into other universes for power, you're going to use up all your local material in space. However, uh, we actually have an episode coming up, I think in late January or early February, called Colonizing Red Dwarfs, that uh, looked at why we would Dyson those up and why we'd have problems with that, which is ironically going to be followed up by three other episodes because it got to be an interesting topic, uh, one of which is Colonizing Giant Stars, uh, and then another is Killing Stars, and then another is uh, Exostellar Civilizations for Living After Stars. <laughs> um, the billion dimmest stars in our galaxy, the, the dimmest billion of them, right, are not as bright in total as some of the brightest stars in our galaxy. We have individual stars, and I don't talk about supernovas, individual living stars in the main sequence that are brighter than the billion dimmest red dwarf star galaxy. Um, when you're building a Dyson sphere, keep that in mind. You know, you you have these little dim red dwarfs, they are very efficient, they'll keep running for a trillion years, um, but they are not that powerful. Um, and you start dimming a star down by star lifting and things like that, you're weakening the power you get out of it. And it might not really want to start that's going to run for a trillion years, especially when you probably have something like commercial fusion already, or especially when you have options like potentially taking apart a star and feeding it into a black hole. Um, and these are things to be keeping in mind for these, but another thing to keep in mind is you say, well, if we got fusion, or if we got black hole-based energy, we could just feed matter down one, why do we have these stars, or why do we even bother with stars? And say, well, you're no longer using a star as your power source, so it's still free power, so you might be using it, it depends on the economics. And if they aren't useful for that, you're going to take them apart by that same technology, star lifting or even putting a black hole into a very careful orbit around it. Um, and uh, one of my cats is doing antics on my couch at the moment. <laughs> but I will we'll flick over that while I continue to talk about that. <laughs> you can see him, he's hiding right behind the camera, this big orange blob. Go smile, flash. <laughs> so, going back to discussion of... of um, feeding matter into black holes, you're still going to get that infrared signature. And why is that that frequency? We say, well, a red dwarf mostly emits infrared too. A red dwarf emits infrared at like the 2,000 or 1,000 Kelvin range. Uh, we emit it around 300 Kelvin. We might process it down to 30 Kelvin style with a matrioska brain. The lower the emission, the lower the energy heat uh, of that involved, the more efficiently extracted energy from in the end. Um, and you want to keep doing that by thermodynamics until you get as cool as possible, but it's very hard to get much cooler than that. Yeah, you can have all these red dwarfs bundled up, but if you're not actually seeing them in the, like, the 300 Kelvin or less range, that means they're not involved with biological life. It'll be 300 Kelvin or less. And that's kind of the signature we're looking for. Uh, James Cambius, thank you for your donation. And he says, how long would it take to build a K2 Dyson sphere? Um... Then we just do an episode on that. <laughs> um, how long will we do that? This week's episode was Low Tech College Chef 2 Civilizations. And the idea there being that you would just be doing something like a Chicago Thrust or power satellites. All you're doing is collecting energy. Uh, at that point in time, the question is how quickly can you bootstrap something like that together? And there, it's not a question of how fast you could do it. Like, for instance, you could come in with gigantic solar sails to a brand new solar system. Uh, that you imported and have the thing up and running inside a couple of years, minus whatever the travel time was. Here we can construct it pretty quick. How fast can you mass produce aluminum foil? And it basically comes down to how fast can you grow your need for that power. And you could potentially create a Dyson sphere if you had self replicating machines and a built up solar system in, I mean, maybe under a year. Maybe under a year, but I usually think it was decades or centuries still, even way, just because it's how quickly can you build a house? In theory, you can do it in a day. It's how quickly can you change tiles? Ask guys in NASCAR, 13 seconds. How long does it usually take? So. Andrew Lewis says, steam turbines have to he a heat to work efficiency of around 40%. Is there any way to get more efficient intermediate steps so that whatever is generating the heat has higher output for the same input? Um, I mean, we got certain types of turbines that can do over 90%, for instance, they're just uh, mechanical ones, right? They're, they're not heat engines. Um, Usually it's very hard to get anything about 50% even on paper, uh, that, that's that going to be a thermodynamics based. Um, but I don't really see how you could do much better than we're doing right now, but if we, you know, again, if I could come up with a theoretical way to do that, 
uh, I'd patent it and we'd have much more efficient power reactors. So. DT Finham says, if you had $50 billion in capital, what space or tech startups or projects would you start? And thanks for the videos. You're very welcome. Uh, I was about to ask if you said 15 or 50, but I don't think it makes a difference. Five zero. Five zero, 50 billion. Well, that might make a difference. Uh, if I had $50 billion that I could simply put into space industry development, I think that the big one really would be trying to prototype an orbital ring and a launch loop. Um, and I especially probably wouldn't have blown through most of that money trying to get the prototypes up and running or something like that. Um, but I, I guess I would probably start throwing it into, into various ones, but we haven't done the prototypes yet because we tend to think of them as big capital throw in with a relatively low success rate. So if I didn't have to report to Congress with it, that would probably be throwing it into would be a basic orbital ring, um, something with moon extraction of creating of either aluminum foil or something similar to that, and uh, maybe a sky hook. Mm-hmm. Warren Park says, what do you think our biggest achievement will be in the next 10 years? Um, our biggest achievement in the next 10 years. I'm assuming no one's going to drop us $50 billion like, to accomplish that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say probably the big one, because of the crisis we're in right now, that always motivates us towards something. Um, as we start to get out of this crisis, the big one is going to be, let's never have this happen again. You know, it's been... We've had quite a few plagues in the last century, and 101 years ago we had like the Spanish flu kill 50 million people. I would say the next decade is all going to be about um, plague prevention as a kind of a secondary note, much the same way the last decade was very focused on counterterrorism concerns for airports. Um, but I would also say the real big invention that we're going to have, the real big transition, is going to be a lot more remote work and all the change was that. You know, when you're working at home, you know, you know, as an example, uh, I was a homeschooler. I think a lot of folks might be more inclined to homeschool if they were working at home. So people who are on the edge of that might sift around to that. You might see a lot more schools trying to try new programs, no in-between steps, things like that. But the big thing will be all the remote work, all the social distancing, the, the, the both benefits and collateral damage for that in terms of remote work, delivery, prevention. Those will be where the big thing for the next decade are going to be in terms of achievements. Alexander Seaman says, Hey, Isaac, in the far future, do you think that gold will retain its status as the most valuable precious metal, or do you think that something else will take its place? Mm. Hmm. I mean, if we were to remove the ones that are specifically fissile, like, well, I mean, uranium is quite cheap, but those could potentially become very valuable. Uh, plutonium, for instance. If we're just talking the precious metals like copper, palladium, silver, uh, gold, then I would say gold will probably tend to stay up near the top. But remember that platinum is usually worth more than gold a lot of times, too. And I believe palladium is, too. So it's it's a classic, but it's not that super rare in the universe. And it just becomes which one is going to be most valued and least rare. Do you keep reading lists? <laughs> I mostly listen, keep audio listening lists, and uh, interestingly, I'm listening to a book by uh, one of our editors right now, Jerry Gurren. Um, it's a nice, fancy historical fan fiction uh, set in the 12th century. Um, I keep a list of books on our website, isaacalthor.net. If you go to that, you'll see the tab on there. There will be one of the tabs that says uh, books. It's right next to the donate tab. Um, and that I haven't updated too much in the last few months, but that does have like all of our lists of not only book of the months, but... Almost every book that I thought was actually worth recommending. Yeah, Manus Curious says, Hi, Isaac. Would it be possible to devote an episode to going over some of the science fiction series you would recommend? I've read the entire Foundation series and a lot of Asimov and Clark. What is next? Um, I mean, if you've read Foundation and enjoyed it and you read Clark and enjoyed it, uh, the two user suggestions for classics, well, three, um, Heinlein, either uh, Starship Troopers or Stranger or Strange World, uh, Dune, Frank Colbert's series, um, uh, or Endor's Game and Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Coward. Those are usually your next go-tos if you're looking at the big classic ones. And those, all three of them are great. Um, and, uh, of course, Ray Bradbury being there, too. Um, I don't know. We, I've thought sometimes about doing something like a Sci-Fi Sundays or Sci-Fi Saturday show once a month uh, where we just kind of, you know, uh, let our hair down and uh, talked about those, but... There are people who do review science fiction like uh, SF Debris um, that are really very good at it. And when we talk about it, we usually talk about the science that connected to that. So, like, we're talking Foundation series, but we're really talking is psychohistory. 
And so we have an episode on psychohistory, for instance. Uh, we might move in that niche at some point, just to give it a try, you know, but uh, I don't really think of us as, we are very science fiction oriented, but we're not really a science fiction review show, so. Um, we have a question here from Mark Zimmerman. Do you think the population of Earth could realistically ever exceed 10 billion, with a B, given already declining birth rates in the developed world and the decreasing need for humans in work? Uh, they are not declining in the developed world. That is a very false assertion people keep making. <laughs> Uh, there was like a year where the population growth in a selected cherry-picked group of developed world, e.g. Europe, was down. Uh, people have been repeating this. It is not true. Uh, developed world itself is also a very dangerous term to be using. That's kind of a follow-up from like first world, second world, third world. The population of this planet has not declined a single year uh, in my lifetime or to my knowledge in, in the many generations before that. And uh, if you start focusing on what the developed world is versus what the undeveloped world is, that gets really tricky. Uh, the population has continued to rise, but even in the developed world, it's continued to rise. I do not accept any population estimate data because every model of my lifetime that we got up to was wrong, and not just a little wrong. They've all been really wrong. So, um, The population could decline. The population growth rate probably will actually decline a little bit, the growth rate. But uh, the idea that the anyone's predicting like the population will be 9 billion by the year 2060, Go back to 1970 and see how uh, they predicted it was going to be at 16 billion by, I think, 2016. And uh, I think we missed that one. But uh, do not believe population estimates. They are always wrong. <laughs> they are worse than the weather. However, if we assume the population was going to decline, uh, which is a possibility, of course, there are so many steps a civilization can take, same as if they're fighting overpopulation. And I think what people tend to forget is that we took a bunch of those steps. Our declining population in the developed world is largely based off the fact that we were terrified at the beginning of the previous century, through about the middle of the century to the Green Revolution, that we were going to have a massive overpopulation problem. So we began taking a lot of steps to prevent that. We are still in them. Uh, if we need to reverse those, that would not be a problem. So I don't see any reason why the population has to suddenly massively, freakishly decline. I think their probably is going to keep raising, but... If it does stop, it, I don't see why it would stop at 9 billion or 10 billion. So if it stops, well, we're comfortable sporting in. I'm going to get three more questions in before the break, and then we're going to come back on aliens. Okay. Um, we have a donation from Brother Malachi, mm -hmm. and he says, Have you ever done a video on legged vehicles, such as Mecca and the like, and would any have a practical use in combat? If not, would you consider doing one? We did an episode on legged combat vehicles. It was called Power Armor and Giant Robots. <laughs> and uh, I would say uh, we did another one before that, too. I think it was actually the introduction to our Space Warfare episode was uh, about giant robots. But see our episode, Giant Robots and Power Armor. Harry Garrison says, hey, would you consider emergent behavior in an AI to have reached the point that it is deserving of rights? What now? Um, all AI are dumber than, like, hummingbirds. Um, I, guess, I guess that kind of falls on, on what's... I'm not picking on hummingbirds. <laughs> well, it sure sounded like it. I like hummingbirds. Um, they have a lot of brain in that little tiny fluff. They seem very flittery, so maybe... <laughs> I, okay, apparently I'm biased against hummingbirds. Uh, <laughs> our corn AI are still dumber than most of the animals that we tend to respect, like cats and dogs. Uh, so I asked whether or not they have rights. So you should say with things like this, the question is, what's our current attitude on it with existing setups, e.g. are you planning on giving cats or dogs rights, should cats or dogs have rights? Well, if you decide that dogs deserve rights, then I would tend to say an AI of the same intelligence level as them does too. You get something that's as small as a human, then you probably have to be giving it human rights. And the last question before the break is from Colin Cleveland. Thank you, Colin, for your donation. And he says, SpaceX, SN9, here we come. Any thoughts? Um, you know, I, I think they are usually one of those examples of where I let myself get very cynical in the past, so I never do anymore. Uh, when they first started talking about doing reusable rockets over a decade ago, I was one of the many who was like, this isn't going to work. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, Elon Musk has had some terrific failures and some terrific successes, and SpaceX is one of those. And they've had their fair share of failures, too. They have uh, they just keep getting them out there and i admire them as much for just keep going as for their successes so um yeah i love that rocket launch i don't want to explode on the pad but that was still a success i'm looking for the next one that doesn't 
So, and I think that if they can get those running and even a, even a pretty close to what the cost they suggest is going to be for those, then you can start thinking about moon bases inside the next decade or so, if all goes according to plan. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and go to break, and we'll see you in a few minutes. So we will be on break for a couple of minutes, and it's a great time to get in some more questions to our moderators, or grab yourself a drink and a snack. While we're on break, we had an episode on Terraforming a couple weeks back, and afterward I got a number of questions along the lines of which we should terraform first, Mars or Venus, or something else, with the suggested something else usually being either our moon or one of Jupiter's moons. And we explored those options in our episodes Springtime on Mars, Winter on Venus, and Summer on Jupiter, and I generally don't know which we should terraform first, and it depends a lot on how far we are willing to go, and what qualifies as terraforming versus terraforming. But a common question I get is if the Moon, our Moon, could be terraformed, and the answer is yes. Our Moon does have enough gravity to hold an atmosphere, so long as we give it a protective magnetic field, and we talked about how to do that in the terraforming episode a couple weeks back. A green moon or blue moon is a popular idea in science fiction, but usually in the softer sorts of sci-fi, like Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun, rather than those series noted for their scientific realism. However, it is doable enough, not even requiring domey over the whole world, though that would make it much easier, and it would be no easy process either way. As the world closest to our own, as the only one meaningfully visible from here, the Moon might well receive extra attention and efforts, which were not really efficient in time, cost, or labor. And that might mean terraforming efforts of the more extreme kind, potentially all the way down to adding mass to it to make it more of a double planet. Alternatively, as the world closest to our own, it is also the easiest source of raw materials, and might well find itself mined out to build endless ships and orbital habitats. It is always hard to guess what sort of things a future humanity might be focused on for efforts at efficiency or to display prestige and beauty. On the extreme end of efficiency, you might insist everyone uploads their mind to computers and wastes no processing power on frivolous endeavors, while on the far side of the other direction, I could imagine civilizations setting off supernovae to sculpt nebulas hundreds of light years across into memorial clouds and art. Of course we sometimes wonder if maybe someone has already done that, if some ancient precursor civilization carves some sort of art or message in at a galactic or even universal scale, and we'll contemplate that notion and others in our first episode of next year, Civilizations at the Beginning of Time. Before that though, we'll close out the year this Thursday, December 31st, with a look at becoming an interplanetary species. And now, back to our show. And we're back. Well, I promised the audience that our first question would be on aliens, and ImanRasu56 says, If aliens were using something similar to an alcubierre drive for interstellar travel, could we potentially detect the gravitational waves from it? Sure. Um, I don't know that that would really give you all that much. If you had a sensitive enough gravitational detector, yes, you could detect it. Um, but... But unless you're trying to move things that are of stellar mass, I don't know that you have very good luck detecting them. Gravitational detectors using our current technology, um, I've suddenly forgotten what it's called, uh, LIGO, or LICO. There's a laser-based uh, infotrometry system we've been using to detect on Earth that's incredibly sensitive. And it lets us pick up things like you know black holes merging, which is the most powerful event in the universe. Uh, as to actually being able to detect very small ones, I don't know how we go about doing that, that would be a very valuable detector, but if you had one that was very good at picking stuff up like that, then yes, it would be able to pick up and that could be a warp drive if you got one walking. Gear Conrad Tails Thorson, thank you very much for your uh, very generous gift, and he says, Sarah and Isaac, you two are absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for all you do. Ben Prewer says, how would heat dissipation work in a dense Dyson Swarm? Wouldn't massive, wouldn't the heat from the massive radiators on each habitat be absorbed by others nearby, so that the heat eventually reaches the outer habitats? Um, it would, but you have to kind of pass all the heat in a direction. You might be running heat engines on that for that metal too. The, you have that ultimate limitation of how fast you can radiate off your surface into a vacuum, and so if you want to do a multi-layered thing like a multi-layered McCandry cylinder, for instance. Um, you could have a huge amount of radiators on that, something like the uh, forest or uh, fractal radiated obelisks that we talked about in Matryoshka Awards. Uh, but at a certain point, you start saying instead of building these huge surface area, crinkly structures, 
um, that you're going to just make a, a you're just going to make more of them with fewer layers. And there's probably a kind of a price point, if you would, uh, where you say maybe four layers is enough, and it versus our crinkly surface, and we're going to cut down on it after that. But I'd also say don't assume too much that when we're talking about doing like shell boards of orths or you know circular things like oni or sonos that you're actually having multiple independent layers that are the whole way around. I think in a lot of cases you'd kind of have a halfway setup or just in some cases where you're like a hundred layers in one spot similar to a skyscraper only very wide. Um, and uh, in that kind of context you're going to have to do a lot of heat pumping regardless. So assume there is a, basically a maximum convenient amount of internal value area that you would say at this point it's easy to make another structure. Corbin McBride says, Hi Isaac and Sarah, I love the quality content you are providing us with. I wanted to know if you see star uplifting being our ultimate goal and whether you see harvesting other planets besides Mercury. Hmm. Uh, I don't think we'd end up parking anything other than Mercury, if we even do Mercury, just because if someone's actually set up camp on a place like Mars or set up camp on a place like Venus, I, in this solar system, in this, uh, I don't think that you'd be able to actually get anyone who was willing to take it apart after that, especially and keep selling the resources and little bits for you know a billion billion years. Um, I think that you might see some place like Mercury taken apart, but when you get outside of the solar system, I think that in general, whatever is not really being valued as plants for living on, those will just tend to get disassembled uh, almost from the get go. But you always start with your low-hanging fruits, your asteroids, then you move on to your moons, then your smaller plants, then your larger plants, then your star itself. Space Shuttle Atlantis says, Hey Isaac, do you think an artificial superintelligence could help us find and get us on talking terms with aliens if we have such technology by the time of first contact? Um, I think that, well, um, I always tend to think it's a really bad idea to consider building a general intelligence that's super intelligent compared to whatever the norm was for humans at the time, but an artificial intelligence would be a very good approach to creating something like a universal translator, and not just uh, in the classic sense of trying to take apart a language that we didn't know, but even just for doing random translations. If you use a lot of translators, um, they do some interesting translations. Uh, there's like entire comedy sites devoted to bad translations, and, uh, mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence might be a very good way to deal with those kind of translations that we have just with known language. So probably wouldn't need to be super intelligent to do it better than we are doing it these days. With um, an alien. But it could potentially do a very handy job on that. Um, of course, there's a pretty good chance you're talking to aliens and you have a super intelligent AI. You're also talking to an alien AI to begin with. Otter TV says, when do you think we might start building a permanent moon base? I think we might have answered that question in the last live stream as well. but mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's always a question of what the benchmark is. There is no point going back to the moon with people unless you're doing it with the intent of setting up a permanent base. I mean, maybe if you're going there to kind of check it out for six months, something like that, that would be okay. But my general philosophy is you don't do a moon base again until you're ready to stay there. Um, you know, you might be ready to take off if you need to, but we don't go back to the moon with people until we plan to stay there. And that could be as soon as 10 years, honestly. If, if SpaceX's new rocket works as well as planned, they can go out fast enough, then yes, that is on the table. I tell and I think that's optimistic, but that's because we haven't had people on the moon my entire lifetime. So, you know, it tends to make one just a little bit shaded. <laughs> Mercurian Brachyscrone Trajectories, LTD, uh, thank you for your donation. And he asks, could we build a lunar rotovator using Starship? Yeah, you could do a skyhook on the moon. Uh, one nice thing about skyhooks, uh, on all these moons and other things like that is they work very well so long as the thing is round enough that you could actually have a relatively circular orbit over top of it. Uh, in that case, because they don't have an atmosphere, you can swing very low. I mean, you could swing down grass off the pad if you had the pad on the highest point of the orbit. Like, if it was a circular orbit around a planet and you, the pickup pad was on top of a mountain or something that was relatively high there, the skyhook can grab it right off the ground. Um, but uh, the one problem with doing things like skyhooks on places like the moon or a place of lower gravity with no atmosphere is you start wondering why you don't just do a very long you know rail gun or coil gun or space catapult on the ground and just angles out simon fowler welcome farmer sorry simon farmer welcome back Hi, and simon. thank you for your donation again as well he says plutonium in uh, oh gosh i can't pronounce this 
Perzelbiski's. Perlusky's stall? Yeah, that one. I think I mispronounced it too, but I know that stall question is with the old stall. Okay, so anyway, the plutonium in that hard to pronounce star that you just said, narrow band signals from Proxima Centauri. Where is your personal definition of extraordinary evidence? Oh. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. They are, well, here's the thing is, whenever you're looking for signs of something that's a definite sign of life, uh, but you told me straight in my head, by the way? Okay. <laughs> I sometimes get feedback from my wife, and it looked like she was sticking her tongue out of me there, which I think <coughs> she was. Um, <laughs> uh, I love it, Simon. Simon, by the way, is one of the names I actually recognize from the early days of the show. Simon Farmore. I think he's been with us since season one or two. So, hi, Simon. Um, okay, so what qualifies as evidence of intelligence? If you can hit it from two different angles. That's pretty much always what it's going to be for me on these things. Where we're looking at the Fermi Paradox, what I usually say is intelligence recognized intelligence. You can find one lone hammer in the, in the woods and say, wow, that's from an intelligent civilization. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's a weathered down rock that's hammer shaped. The thing is, when you're finding civilizations, you probably are not going to find one artifact, one sign. And it's, you know, you're not going to mistake New York City as a random object. But that's what you're probably going to find, right? And the first thing you're going to find if you come to Earth uh, is a ridiculous number of signs that there's intelligence here. And if all you can find is one thing that's debatable, that might be a sign of intelligence or might be a sign of civilization, and nothing else, then it probably isn't. Uh, otherwise, if it's one of those cases where, you know, if it was a signal that was like a television signal from an alien planet, we wouldn't be debating at all if it was maybe uh, a sign of life or not. We'd just say, well, yeah, there we go. Spaceship lands in the front lot of the White House, you don't say, that might be alien, or it might be a random asteroid. You know what it is. So <laughs> that tends to be my attitude on those things. Ray Spring says, have you read about Sir Roger Penrose's objection reduction idea and his and Hammeroff's orc or extension about consciousness? The basic notion of that one uh, for orc or, for instance, um, and uh, actually, I know you and I had a conversation about that way back in 2016 at Dave Schroeder's house. Uh, is, is can the brain be quantum? Uh, is the brain quantum? And the answer, of course, is yes, the brain's quantum. Everything is quantum. Uh, the brain is at a small enough scale that quantum events can affect your thinking, minimally, right? Uh, the closer you get to the quantum scale, the more likely quantum effects are to actually bubble up to the macroscopic or that scale. So a quantum event, bubbling up to our level, very hard to do. Bubbling up to like the cellular level or the neuron level, still very real, but it does occasionally happen. You won't be able to predict everything a human brain is going to do weighs out no matter how good your machinery is, uh, because there will be a quantum effect somewhere in there that you couldn't have predicted. That you know there's you got a hundred billion neurons. Every so often one of those is going to have a slight tweak to what it would have done based on a quantum phenomena. Now as to whether or not consciousness is something that takes place at the quantum scale um, that's a lot harder to argue, and of course you have to start by deciding what is consciousness. You know, it's kind of like uh, one of those questions where you want to be careful how you define it. Uh, as an example, quantum mechanics often use the indication that there's such a thing as free will. Now, I tend to assume there is free will. I don't even waste my time considering a universe in which free will does not exist. However, quantum mechanics and randomness and uncertainty are not themselves indications that free will exists. Because simply events being random does not necessarily mean that you have free will any more than a coin does. So uh, I would say there is probably quantum aspects of consciousness, but I wouldn't really say that that, that that is a feature of the quantum level. Amelia Slante says, do you think that the energy requirements of wormholes would depend upon the size and not the distance? Could you move whole planets and even stars with a big enough wormhole if you had the energy? Um, well, the an interesting thing about it is, is the theories for how to make a wormhole prior to a couple of ones that are very, very uh, iffy on, on the basic math. But the basic wormhole concept usually requires several solar masses to build. Um, and you could transport a plant through them very easily because they had plenty of space for it. The idea there, of course, is can you make a, um, a neck, a stable neck that can get through so you don't get crushed going down? That's what requires your negative matter. I don't believe in negative matter, so I don't think that you're going to actually ever get one of those to walk. But um, they are your throat uh, or your mass of that wormhole. That is the controlling factor. How much mass it has is the uh, how big an object you can transport connected there. Distance shouldn't matter at all. So, 
But that's, again, an assumption of a lot of theory there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gancio the Ranter says, Hi Sarah and Isaac. Do you think that a complex human civilization could collapse due to the degrading social cohesion related to transhumanism? And would baseline humans post... I'm sorry, would baseline humans trust post-human entities? Do you trust people who are smarter than you? Uh, is the question there. Well, that depends. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, 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 that's, that's the answer on that question, too. Is diversity something that causes civilizations to collapse? And that's the other question there. Um, and, of course, the answer there is it depends, too. Does diversity cause empires to fall? Sometimes they do fall from that. Whether or not that's a bad thing is a little bit debatable. Um, one might say that Rome fell from diversity as well, but I don't know that necessarily was a bad thing. Uh, did green hair versus pink hair and people you know, dye their hair whatever color they wanted to cause civilizations to collapse? Probably not. Um, it's going to depend a lot on what the change is. When you're talking about transhumanism, that can be something as simple as we no longer have people missing arms or legs. That might be something as simple as now people can see in the infrared range, you know, ultraviolet. It might mean they think a little bit smarter. Could that cause a civilization to collapse? Absolutely. Uh, would it? I don't know. I don't know. We have a question from Colt. Actually, it's to several questions. He says, is the U.S. Navy patent for an electrogravitic anti-gravity vessel viable from a physics standpoint? This question has bugged me for ages, but I lack the knowledge to come to my own conclusion. Um, I don't believe that you can actually have any anti-gravity advice to the variety that folks tend to talk about in those circles. Uh, I don't believe the Navy has one of these, to be honest. Um, it would already be out there and use if it was. But... Uh, a thing to keep in mind with a lot of patents that the military does or doesn't have or that you hear about them is just because the military has patented something doesn't mean it actually works. Um, and uh, just because people say that the military has patented something doesn't mean they actually have. But I am not familiar with any anti-gravity devices that have been demonstrated to work. And that is to be always the proof of the pudding. Barry J. Burns has a question on the Fermi Paradox. Since we're looking into the past, when we look farther out, life that started at the same time of us wouldn't be visible. What do you say? Uh, if something had uh, popped up in the Andromeda Galaxy even 1.9 million years ahead of us, it wouldn't be visible because it's 2 million light years away. Uh, the problem here, and, and I understand what comes up with this, the um, universe is listed to be 13.8 billion years old, last estimate. Uh, our planet is 4 billion years old and changed, last estimate, and we should have had planets similar to our own popping up at least 6 to 10 billion years ago, last current estimates. Um, our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. So, you know, if anything had popped up in that time, it should be visible. You start going out to a galaxy and say, well, now the sample is even bigger. There's no one in our galaxy, but maybe there's one in a neighboring galaxy. Well, it's 2 million light years away. 2 million light years is nothing compared to a billion years. So we go out to a bigger distance. The volume of space and the galaxies in it loosely rises with the cube of that distance. So if I look out twice as far, there are eight times as many potential civilizations. I look out ten times as far, there are now a thousand times as many civilizations. So if I was expecting to find one in a ten million light year area, and I now look out to a billion light year area, where plants might start to be thinning out at that point, a billion years in the past, I'm now looking at an area a hundred times more than that, with a million times many galaxies in it. That kind of math, that curve doesn't work out. The volume is rising that fast. You look three billion light years away, and you don't see anything, then you can start saying, well, maybe it's too soon for any civilizations to have arisen. That's usually why I say with the Dyson Dilemma, I don't think it's very likely, based on that, that there's any civilizations within a billion light years of us. Because it seems like if there was one within, say, half a billion, that it just emerged 499 million years ago and wasn't quite visible yet, then there should be at least one in a volume 100 times bigger than that that's just a little bit older and we need to sign that curve because there's so many more options there. We have a question from St. Lauren Beats again. Do you believe that Ray Kurzweil, even with his nearly 90% prediction accuracy rate, that we will have the singularity around 2045? I don't think he would claim he has a 90% prediction accuracy rate. Um... For a while, when this show was transitioning from being a hobby to a profession, I joked about what I should put on my business card, and I thought about putting professional CEO. I'm right 51% of the time. Um, I've always had a great deal of admiration for that man. He is a very good at predicting things, and I cannot imagine he would ever claim he was accurate 90% of the time. <laughs> so um, He's made uh, quite a few bad guesses, um, some of which I agreed with him was wrong about, too. 
Um, but uh, he, yeah, I, I don't think you could say that he was accurate 90% of the time. Um, is he good at making guesses? Yes. Uh, has he been off on some things? Oh, yeah. Um, predictions about, you know, for instance, voice control of computers. It was one of the ones that always popped in my head because I thought it would be a very likely one, too, but was more pessimistic because of my speech impediment. I thought it would be very unlikely as generation after generation of uh, speech text software failed that they would actually meet the deadline of all these optical, all these various devices being controlled by voice, as none of them ever seemed to work for me. But um, little tiny things can throw off predictions. Um, and he makes some good ones. But about the singularity, I've always thought that one required too many assumptions on it. The first being that the you know, Moore's Law is a real form law that computers are always going to double. That's not actually Moore's Law, but that's what it amounts to, that they double every X number of years. Well, they don't. Right? The follow-up on that is that you also have to assume that an AI for self-learning is going to be able to make a smarter computer than itself. Well, I'm a self-learning machine, so are you. When was the last time you made an AI smarter than yourself, by yourself? And then the other concept of the singularity like that is that it could do it faster each time around. They could make a smarter one each time, and that's iffy. And you have to have all three of those to really get the singularity that people tend to talk about. And it has to happen fast so that you don't have any parallel things that are almost as good out there. That's where I tend to think that that notion of that particular version of singularity is wrong. There are other versions of it, uh, but that tends to be the one that people tend to think of by default. Hitesh Kar says, Hey Isaac, would alien civilizations be willing to share their knowledge of the universe with us humans, considering we still have a long ways to go to understand true physics? Uh, one more time, please. Hey Isaac, would alien civilizations be willing to share their knowledge of the universe with us humans, considering we still have a long ways to go to understand true physics? Nope. Aliens would not share the science with us because they do not. You know that because they, either they don't do it and they don't want to share it, or they don't exist, in which she's not going to share it with us. I'd share it with another civilization. I don't support the Prime Directive in Star Trek at all. <laughs> I, I do support the basic notion that you you know keep your nose out of other people's business. Right? It, it's it's not you're going to do yourself or other people much good to be jumping in everywhere as war. But at the same time, um, you know, I I. I I would not let an asteroid crash into, crash into a primitive alien planet, and I wouldn't let a plague wipe them out either. You know, I, I don't know that I'd always get my nose too heavily involved in that, but um, I, I don't think there, there was some slippery slope analogies there, but uh, I'd rather those slippery slopes were ethical slopes, not ones covered in the blood of innocent people who died because I didn't feel like getting involved. And uh, I don't think aliens would tend to all feel the same on that issue. And so if they're out there en masse, they should be sharing their technology with us. So you know, A, they don't exist, or B, they're not in a position to share it with us, either because it's ethically wrong or it's just not practical because they fall away. Alexander Kroll says, which planet or moon within the solar system would you like to explore in person the most? In person? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> most of the interesting things in the solar system are on this planet. Uh, the tallest moon, uh, tallest mountain is on Mars, uh, but it's not really the, the the struggling climb you people tend to think of it is when they say, "Wow, oh, that thing's two and a half times bigger than Mount Everest." Uh, it's also much much wider than Mount Everest. You could stroll up it even if it wasn't on Earth gravity, but it's on lower motion gravity, so it's not much of a hike. Um, and uh, there are a lot of very interesting features in our solar system. They really are. You could go cloud sailing on Venus, you know, or you know, Jupiter. And we looked at that in our uh, space tourism episode. But uh, for the most part, Earth is where a lot of the interesting stuff is at that I'd like to explore. I really have no desire personally to go visiting these things. So since you're talking about Mars, Jim Matterhorn says, Hey Isaac, if we discover life on Mars, should we stop future settlement efforts? Tricky. Um, it depends on what we find there. Um, any place we find life, period, right now, we want to be very careful not to damage that life because of the scientific value of it. But if we found life there, I'm like, wow, this is almost exactly the same as an Earth lichen. Uh, then we have to consider the possibility that it might actually be an Earth lichen that got transported or vice versa. Um, if all we find is we go out in the universe is various types of lichen and algae, once we've had a chance to take a sample of them, take some good samples of them, make sure we've exhaustively found all those samples and analyzed them, I don't really personally see all that much value in, um, in a lichen that I preserve a whole planet as a nature preserve to it. Uh, on the other hand, if we got all these things that we find that's got like dinosaurs or cats or anything that would qualify as like an intelligent thinking or really complex life form, yes, preserve that. Uh, maybe not on the planet though. Maybe you put it into a rotating habitat. I tend to think that it's much easier 
in the long term to maintain quarantine inside a closed cylinder uh, where you can put it wherever you want and inside a planet, especially with all the resources the planet represents. The Real Boliath asks, what are the odds that once the whole galaxy is colonized, we will forget which planet we came from, like we see in the Foundation series? I always kind of like that one as a play around notion, is uh, how far in the future does it happen? You say, well, data's cheap. It should be so easy to remember where you come from. Uh, especially though you might not be able to do archaeology because there might not be a plant or to, uh, to excavate on at that point. Um, you should have no problem maintaining copies of records that long, but you think about it, what are the odds over the course of the next million years you'll have a plant where people decide to rewrite history so that they are the, you know, at least on that plant, they're the ones who claim to be the first species. What are the odds if we say that's a 50-50 chance it would happen once on a planet in a million year period, how long does it take before almost every planet in the galaxy has now made that claim, a billion years? And so it's not the idea that you might have, um, you know, not have lost the data, but you might have so many false or revised or, or you know, changed around fake histories competing for that title that you might be able to lose that information. But truth be told, I don't think that you would. But not not something that elementary. But it's a possibility to remember. You know, you're not going to lose the data the way we used to in terms of the records getting lost. You lose the records uh, data because there's so many other records that are false for one reason or another. Simon the Blind, thank you for your very generous contribution, and uh, he says, thank you for the amazing content. It's made for some terrific binging while I wait out some medical issues. I wish I had a question, but as someone who once took Star Trek as hard sci-fi, I'm still wrapping my brain around most of these concepts. Um, thank you very much. I hope you feel better soon. Your, your medical situation is working out well. Um, last night, I watched Encounter at Fall Point. That is the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. The one where they actually try a little bit harder to keep the science solid. At one point in there, they're docking the bottom half of the Enterprise, the, the top half of the Enterprise. Something only does a few times a series. Uh, it's a cool feature they don't use much. And at one point, uh, Captain Riker says, um, All velocities are zero. We'll let all inertia tear us through. You know, and then they should, you know, it's going to glide forward and dock. Of course, if your velocity is zero, you don't have any inertia. You're not moving. So. <laughs> um, they were always very bad about checking their science on those things. Um, and basically the comparison was how they stack up to something like Star Wars or Flash Gordon. And uh, I would I would never call Star Trek hard science fiction. It's one of my favorites. I mean, I could probably say the same about Stargate too. I love Stargate and they were better about it than Star Wars was or Star Trek. But, you know, a lot of sci-fi shows are never going to be good on hard sci-fi and that's probably okay. But uh, it makes it fun to learn about them. You get to enjoy the episode for itself and you get to enjoy it by going, what? That's not how that works. <laughs> another think... generous donation from tom michael and he says hi isaac thanks for the great shows what are your thoughts on sci-fi that deals with the cyberpunk t ideology knowing that populations have been dropping in size over the past years and the trend is still rapidly going down the population as i mentioned earlier is at a record high level <laughs> and i again um the, the cyberpunk oh the cyberpunk genre um you know, my favorite movie is Blade Runner, the original. Uh, I was I did enjoy the sequel. They eventually did turn out Blade Runner twenty forty seven, but not the same thing. Um, I love the cyberpunk genre. It's a great one. It's very dystopian, <laughs> but um, you don't have to think that something is uh, um, you know uh, prophetic to believe that it's fun to watch. But at the same time, um, I don't think the cyberpunk genre is really where we're going to expect the war to be um, over 40k for that matter. And so it's always a good one. And if you're getting into cyberpunk, by the way, I'd recommend Blade Runner. I'd recommend uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, book, Snow Crash, and uh, Will, uh, William Gibson's No Romance series too. But uh, uh, before we close out for today, uh, hopefully everyone's been able to see the comments coming up on the screen. This is my first time trying that up. I probably need to change it around so the background is uh, not white. Um, and it was, hopefully it was popping up as people went by when they were donating to things and uh, and subscribing. But we'll be playing around with that. Some new features with new software that's available for us on uh, Streamlabs OBS. Uh, we'll be, this is our last live stream for the year, not our last episode. We still have one more to go and uh, on December 31st. And then, of course, we'll start the year back up uh, with Civilizations at the beginning of time on January 7th. So if I didn't get to your question today, apologies. Again, we're trying out some new software too and had some people away for the holidays to help out. Uh, feel free to leave them in the comments section on, um, on the YouTube site or if this actually did run on our Facebook uh, uh, forum, feel free to leave them there and I'll try to get to them this evening or tomorrow. All right, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you next year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. 
So that will wrap us up for the day. I want to thank everyone for joining us and again if we didn't get to your question, feel free to post it as a comment below and I'll try to get to it this evening. Also you can continue the conversation at any of the forums on Facebook, Reddit, Discord, or our website IsaacArthur.net. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you Thursday.